Wish you all a very, very good morning. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can hear me from wherever you are. And uh, this lecture <coughs> on the current classification of periodontal diseases uh, is probably one of the most important lectures that you'll be able to have when it comes to your entire dental curriculum. Because this lecture encompasses on how you identify periodontal diseases, uh, how do you diagnose them, what terminologies you use to describe a certain classification or a certain, <laughs> a certain clinical condition, what are the features which fit a certain clinical condition, and then also how to communicate with your colleagues across the world along this platform. So, what is classification? A classification scheme for periodontal and periodontal diseases and conditions is necessary. Why do we require classification? Yes, please understand this. A classification scheme for periodontal and periodontal diseases and conditions is necessary for clinicians to properly diagnose and treat patients, as well as for scientists to investigate the etiology, the pathogenesis, the natural history, and treatment of the diseases and conditions. So, classification of diseases forms the current stone of how you deal with a disease, okay? So without a classification, you won't be in any position to treat a particular patient or a condition, okay? So when we look at periodontal diseases or peri-implant diseases, because any disease that encompasses the bone as well as the soft tissue or the natural tooth or its replacement comes under the peri perspective, okay? So the reason to have classification is that you need to properly diagnose the condition. So there are certain signs and symptoms what you have learned. For example, gingivitis has got change in color, contour, consistency, etc. Same way for pedonomasis. So unless you are able to group, unless you are able to group certain signs and symptoms as a disease A, as a disease B, as a disease C, you won't be in a position to treat it. You won't be able to identify the etiology, etc. etc. So for that very reason, you need to diagnose. And for diagnosis, you need classification. Okay? So that's why we are looking at what we call as classification of the diseases. Okay? Apart from classification, we are also looking to investigate the etiology. When we identify certain signs and symptoms, when I say, okay, these are the various signs and symptoms of a particular disease, then I will start investigating what has caused this particular kind of disease. And for that very reason, we will have to have classification. Once obviously the etiology is known, then you want to study how the disease progresses and that's why the pathogenesis. The natural history, so for how long has this disease been? Has, is this a new disease like COVID-19 or it's a pretty old disease that's been already reported in the history? Though the terminology uh, that has been used to describe the disease may be different, but has this been reported earlier in history, in the history of, here of the humankind, then we need to check that out. And what were the treatments done then? And how did the people respond? And what are the consequences? So we can detect a lot of conditions from our uh, natural history of humankind. And then eventually, what you call for treatment. Unless and until you know what the classification, unless and until you are sure that this disease fits into this category, I am not in a position to treat the particular condition. So for that very reason, I need to know what I call as why we would want to. And for that very reason, I would want to know the classification of every click disease that affects the oral cavity and primarily the periodontal and peri implant conditions. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit of an echo there. Yeah, that's let's go that echo. Yeah. So coming to the next part. Why we classify? Exactly, we are classifying every clinical condition to identify the disease so that we diagnose it. We segregate one clinical entity from the other. So it means that what is gingivitis is gingivitis and what is periodontitis is periodontitis. So we, we should be able to identify two separate diseases. So that's what we need to uh, identify. Uh, that's what we need to have a classification. Hello? 
हाँ प्रभु हाँ एक बार तड़े एक बार तड़े so we uh, continue here uh, uh, understanding the segregation of one thing and taking it from the so we need to have classification that tells us a is separate from b and b both are not same because the etiology pathogen as well as treatment for all of them is completely different very very important factor for uh, classification is we need to assess the prognosis prognosis means every time i tell a patient that this is your problem they would say doctor if i undergo treatment what will be the outcome will my tooth survive in the mouth will it undergo an extraction whatever for that matter so for that reason to understand the prognosis i need to have a classification obviously as we discussed just a bit more earlier we need to know for determining the kind of treatment that we need to intervene and very very importantly is for communication and information why is this important yes we live in a connected world okay uh, so we are having patients who stay here in Hubli and they travel all the way to US, to Australia, to New Zealand, and vice versa. So we want to have people coming from one area of the world to the other area. So if there's a patient who has a certain problem from his native area and they come to our area or the other way around, they need to be following a certain standard terminology of diagnosis. So if I say periodontitis here, even the dentist in the US or Australia or Brazil, anywhere in the world should be able to make out, yes, what does the doctor mean when he is told that this patient has got periodontitis? So it's very important for communication and very, very important based on information. What do we mean by information here? The word information here means that when we conduct a clinical trial, for example, I am trying to identify a certain etiology, or if I say that, okay, uh, for periodontitis patients, uh, the treatment for four to six millimeters of pockets of patients with periodontitis would start with non-surgical therapy and then local drug delivery or any other kind of intervention. We run a clinical trial. So when I mean that we run a clinical trial here in Hubli, it should be the same thing what would apply to any patient who would undergo a procedure. If I say that, okay, six millimeter pockets are very effectively treated by non-surgical therapy and does not require surgery, it means that any patient with a six millimeter pocket in any part of the world, if he undergoes a proper non-surgical therapy, it should still be effective and prevent surgical requirement in those patients. So that's why the use of terminology or inf for information and dissemination of information between professional colleagues is absolutely important. So when you write an article in a journal or a publication, so when we mean the word periodontitis, it means these are the parameters for that particular condition. That's why we need to classify this so that it's very easy for us to communicate across all around the world. So what has been a classification or with problem with uh, periodontal disease classification till now? Till now, most of the classification systems have one or the other big, big flaw. And what, what are the problems? The problems were that all information, all diseases were classified as itis. It means information. Information is the most prominent features of all periodontal diseases. That is, it, it can be a primary cause. That is, the inflammation can be a result of the irritation. Or secondly, that is, it can be due to a superimposition. For example, Okay, if someone is not maintaining good hygiene, he develops inflammation around the, of the gingiva, so that's gingivitis. On the other hand, someone is taking medications, someone who didn't have inflammation, gingivitis was not there, but they start taking certain medications like phenytoin sodium, the gingiva starts enlarging. And in these patients, because of the enlargement, they're unable to maintain hygiene and then the inflammation superimposes. Okay, so the inflammation becomes secondary. So the time at which the patient comes to your clinic, okay, determines what is the kind of diagnosis. And that's why information starts creating a lot of problems when it comes to diagnosis of periodontal disease. Okay. Secondly, the word itis meant that anything and everything that caused inflammation of gingiva was clubbed into the same. For example, whether someone who had gingivitis due to poor oral hygiene or someone who had gingivitis due to AIDS or necrotizing ulcerative disease, they're all clubbed as itis. And that was not right. Periodontitis, on the other hand, was a general term for all condition affecting the underlying supporting structure. So someone, everyone who had a bond or a recession, they all clubbed into periodontitis. Okay. And if there was a problem with the uh, systemic conditions causing periodontal disease, that was never grouped into one. 
The second and most important problem with periodontal disease classifications, even today, is that the etiology is not well defined. Periodontal disease etiology is multifactorial and it is not specific to one particular organism. Okay, uh, single specific organism conditions like tuberculosis. We know when someone uses the word tuberculosis, we know that it is caused by M tubercle bacilli, and that's what it is. Okay, it can't be anything else. Okay, or if someone says it's a pneumococcal pneumonia, it means that it's caused by pneumococcus. On the other hand, we do not have a certain specific bacteria which say, okay, pernonti disease is caused only by this particular organism. It doesn't happen like that because there are more than 500 different species and strains of bacteria in the oral cavity, similar to caries. Okay, we cannot say all caries is caused only by Streptococcus mutans, it's a primary organism but it can be caused by so many other bacteria in the oral cavity. And so for that very reason, the classification of periodontal diseases based on etiology is not very really well defined. Thirdly, even if I wanted to isolate a particular organism, check whether it was causing, it was not very easy. Now it's much better due to various genomic technologies, but previously it was not so easy. Even till uh, what I call early 2000s, it was still not very easy to isolate and culture so many of these periopathogens. Okay, so the problem with most of the classification systems what we had earlier were, uh, or rather most of the classification systems what we had earlier, a bit more arbitrary in nature. Okay, so the older classification systems include a Suzuki classification which classified disease based as adult periodontitis, rapidly progressive periodontitis, juvenile and post-juvenile and pubertal. What it meant was it basically said the age at which the patient came to your clinic determined the type of periodontitis classification you use. For example, if I am walking into a clinic, uh, I am 40 plus. So if I have pockets, I am adult periodontitis. Imagine if I walked into a clinic, probably at the age of 12, I would be a juvenile periodontitis. If I walked into a clinic at the age of 15 or 20, then I would be a rapidly progressive problem. So the age at which the clinician sees the patient determine the diagnosis and not when or the severity of the disease uh, that the patient may have. Okay, so if someone who was 40 but had very severe disease was still adult periodontitis, and someone who, had, who was 15 but had very, very mild degree of periodontitis was still rapidly progressive. So it was the age at which the patient entered that determined the diagnosis. And this continued in most of the other classifications, uh, like the World Workshop 89 classification, which again used the word adult periodontitis. Then we classified as early onset forms of periodontitis, pre-puberty, that is before genetic puberty and juvenile. They just added a separate terminology here for generalized and localized. So someone who had probably 14 teeth or lesser, it was generalized, uh, was localized. If it was more, then it was generalized. Uh, they added one category in the 89 classification called as periodontitis with systemic conditions. So they said if patients have Down syndrome, type 1 diabetes, papillon deferral syndrome, or AIDS, and if they have periodontitis, then it is periodontitis associated with systemic diseases and not due to plaque or anything else. They also had a category of necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis and then refractive periodontitis. Refractive was these are those categories of patients who underwent multiple rounds of periodontal therapy, but still the disease did not stop and keep very eventually lost. Okay, so the classification problem was that there's no gingival disease category. So everything what happened to gingival without causing a bone loss was always gingivitis and nothing else. And it was the age that was determining as I was telling you earlier. Then Professor Glickman gave his own classification. He classified periodontitis as slowly progressive and rapidly progressive. So he removed age at some point, but he added a category called progressive. Means it means that you need to identify at how fast or how slow is the disease progressing. What it meant? It meant that when a patient walks into your clinic, okay, uh, you see the patient today, and then you do all the probing measurements, etc. And then you recall the patient probably six months down the line or a year down the line, and then redo the probing measurements. And after redoing these measurements, then you check if the attachment loss has been more, if the pockets have been increased by a certain rate, then you put them as slowly progressive. If the attachment loss has been very fast, if so, for example, someone who had a 4 mm pocket or a mid buckle of 2-1, it became 6 in one year's time, then you probably call it as aggressive. But if it was four and it became 4.2, then you would categorize it slowly progress. So 
at no point in time you could make a diagnosis on day one of the patients walking into your clinic. So diagnosis is never made, at least for six months or a year. So that was a problem with this classification system. He also added an age component called uh, uh, the, either of these could be adult onset means can be happening at an adult age or at an earlier age that would be prepubert or juvenile necrotizing and refractory. He also added a few categories of trauma from occlusion, periodontal atrophy, and most of these ended up becoming empirical terminologies rather than very specific findings. And again, similar problem, age, gingival disease, and based on rate of progression. Okay, so due to all these problems with the previous classifications, okay, uh, the World Workshop, that's Association of the Periodontal, uh, Periodontals, uh, Periodont, uh, most of us periodontals, periodont, uh, periodontals around the world, okay, uh, came into being and we created a classification system in the year 1999, that was when I had just done, joined my post-graduation. Okay, the year I joined my post-grad, we came with a new classification system, okay. Uh, what this classification system did, it subclassified gingival and periodontal diseases into two major sections of gingival diseases and periodontal diseases. So instead of the word gingivitis and periodontitis, it became a gingival disease and periodontal disease. What this meant was when I use the word gingival disease, okay, it means that the inflammatory factor or the disease factor is restricted only to the peri. Uh, to the soft tissue that's only the gingiva and does not involve the alveolar bone or the cement uh, or the periodontal ligament. On the other hand, when I use the word periodontal disease, it means that apart from soft tissue injury or inflammation, I also have issues. We also have issues wherein we see that there is a consistent amount of bone loss, attachment loss happening around these teeth or in these situations. We just do a small verification here. I'll just pause the. Okay, so we started the international classification on. Uh, Periodontal diseases, which came in the year 1999. So, as I was uh, telling you earlier, as I was telling you earlier, <clears throat> yeah, as I was telling you earlier, there's a bit of echo happening there. Okay, so let's try and see. Record a bit more better here. Oh, yeah. So, as I was telling you earlier, uh, that the gingival diseases category was not there at all. So, we now have a new category of gingival disease that got added. Now, what did this say? It said that irrespective of the source of the information, let's group entire gingival diseases category into a separate section. So what happened here was we classified gingival diseases into two sections, primarily plaque induced and modified by systemic factors, okay, with another local factors. Modified by, uh, so primarily all the gingival diseases are plaque induced, okay, caused by plaque and plaque related factors. So, gingival diseases are caused by other local factors. Gingival diseases were subclassified into plaque induced and modified by other systemic factors. Uh, then further classified by modified by drugs, malnutrition induced gingival diseases, and then the major category of non plaque induced. So, what is said? Section one plaque induced. Plaque induced gingival diseases were again further subdivided with other local factors and without other local factors. What it meant without other local factors means primarily to poor oral hygiene, plaque was accumulating on the surface of the tooth and caused gingival disease. Whereas other local factors can be overhanging perspiration, crown, uh, or some developmental growth, etc., which 
by its very presence caused the plaque to accumulate and not primarily related only to poor oral hygiene. So that became plaque induced gingival disease. Apart from that, uh, we had a section two called as uh, gingival diseases modified by systemic uh, factors. Means uh, what it said was in the presence or absence of these systemic conditions, gingival disease response should be aggravated. So in that section A was an uh, associative endocrine system that is primarily puberty, menstruation, pregnancy, gingivitis, and granuloma, and also diabetes mellitus associated gingival disease. The second section uh, in systemic conditions was with blood dysplasias, primarily leukemia, and if any other blood dysplasia which would manifest in the oral cavity or in the gingival. The third category of modified by systemic cat uh, was uh, gingival enlargement by drugs, which primarily include gingival enlargement and drug induced gingivitis. And there was malnutrition uh, that someone who had a vitamin C deficiency and had gingival disease. It, means, it meant that it was a vitamin C deficiency in due gingival disease. Apart from uh, these factors, then there were very specific conditions. This included non plaque induced gingival disease. What it meant was, irrespective of the presence or absence of plaque, if patients didn't have any plaque, but they could have any of these diseases, what we are describing now. So it includes specific bacterial diseases like gonorrhea, syphilitic, or streptococcal. It includes viral diseases like herpes, which include primary or secondary herpes. It includes candida gingivitis. It also included a condition of as idiopathic gingival fibromatosis, where we know that we could not figure out any etiology. Okay. Apart from that, yes, uh, there are various systemic conditions and manifestations in, in, uh, causing gingival changes, which include mucocutaneous disorders, uh, restorative materials like toothpaste, allergies, traumatics. So anything that caused a change in the gingival was classified as such. For example, you are using a certain toothpaste and then you change to new brand by seeing a television advertisement and then you started developing a lot of inflammatory enlargement or swelling in your gums and teeth. So then that became allergic gingivitis. The next and the most important change in the classification system came in how we classified periodontal disease or periodontitis. What I said was, uh, Please understand I'm sitting in the federal department and recording, so a lot of disturbance going around, so don't be too afraid to. Okay, so periodontal disease uh, was primarily now classified into localized or generalized depending upon the number of teeth that got involved. If 30% or lesser than dentition that include, that means that if you consider 28 teeth, then 10 teeth. If 10 teeth or lesser are involved, then it could be a localized condition. If more than 10 teeth are required, uh, or, uh, or more than 10 teeth are involved in that would be a generalized condition. Okay, so based upon that, the disease got classified as chronic and aggressive uh, disease, chronic, uh, chronic periodontitis and aggressive. Periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease and conditions, so that include hematological disorders like neutropenias and uh, leukemias. Periodontitis due to genetic conditions like familial neutropenias, Down syndrome, papillon liver syndrome, leukocyte radiation deficiency syndrome, etc. Necrotizing periodontal disease became a separate section altogether. Then uh, we also had a classification now for periodontal gingival and periodontal abscesses, endoperial lesions, uh, developmental or required conditions which required, which influenced any of the above. So, for example, if there was a tooth and anterior fracture and because of that gingivitis was there, then that would be gingival disease, secondary to uh, plaque induced gingival disease, secondary to tooth and anatomy issue or a mucogingival problem due to bad renal attachments, etc. So all of them got listed in this section. So the features of this system were that the gingival disease is not separated. So we now can say that yes, gingival disease is a separate section of all periodontal diseases. Okay, plaque induced and non plaque induced got separated. So we now know that if when I use the word herpetic gingival stomatitis, I mean that irrespective of the plaque, patient is going to have gingival inflammation in this particular condition. Periodontitis got categorized as chronic and aggressive, uh, uh, primarily now based upon uh, rate of disease progression and not the age. So age got there removed. So it means that, uh, so someone who is 20 years and has got zero, uh, zero, probably just a millimeter of attachment loss, he can be a chronic periodontitis. Whereas a 40 year old or a 50 year old patient with six mm attachment loss can be an aggressive form of periodontitis. So we now say that the rate of the severity of the loss of attachment will determine 
the kind of diagnosis and not and not the age at which the patient comes into the clinic. Uh, the category of refractory was removed completely. It means that uh, if someone who has a prodontitis even after treatment, then it is retreat. Uh, then it includes that it is probably due to improper treatment or maintenance, and not due to the body is not responding to it. Okay. Uh, however, uh, the 99 classification over the last 20 years, we found that the 99 classification also has its own issues. It's still not based upon etiology. It's still based on rate of progression. So I need at least two or three settings to very categorically say that he's aggressive or a chronic prodontal disease. Okay. And it primarily considered Americans or uh, European patients in the sampling. So in the year uh, 2017, uh, in the year 2017, uh, new classification system started to come into picture because we started seeing that uh, it's important that we start classifying patients separately in a much more detailed and a much more simpler manner. And we also had to start classifying belly implant disease because the number of implants that were being done and patients starting to have problems around those implants. Yes, uh, we had to classify those conditions also. So for that reason, a new classification system came in. What it stated was number one, we removed the condition called as uh, directly diseases. So we now have a diagnosis point called periodontal health. So someone who just doesn't have any signs of inflammation comes to your clinic with absolutely beautiful pink gingiva, no bleeding, nothing. Okay, then they should be categorized as periodontal healthy. So we have now three sections, periodontal health, gingival diseases and conditions as one section, periodontal health is a second condition and the third category of other conditions affecting the periodontium. Okay, periodontal health and gingival health was first section in the this one. Gingivitis, which is primarily plaque induced, came into the second section in the first part. And then we had gingival disease, non dental. So let's see each of them here. The number one is the new classification system 2017 2018, you can call it as. Okay, classified periodontal diseases, periodontal health, and gingival diseases and conditions. So periodontal health and gingival health. Uh, a is gingival, clinical gingival health on intact periodontium. So uh, it means that in most of us who have never undergone a periodontal therapy or a surgery, in, in you or me, if I have gingival inflammation around natural teeth, then it becomes gingival, or I just don't have any inflammation, then it's clinically healthy gingival on an intact periodontium. On the other hand, clinical gingival health on a reduced periodontium. What does the word reduced mean is someone who had periodontal disease. For example, I have a patient in my clinic who has six or eight mm pockets on his or her teeth. I uh, put the patient through a full course of periodontal therapy, uh, surgery, regenerative, etc. I now see that the tissues are at a lower level. It means that probably three mm of the root is completely exposed, but the gingiva around those teeth is absolutely healthy. So it becomes Clinical gingival health on a reduced periodontal patient had a history of periodontal disease, but no more periodontal disease. Okay, so stable and non periodontitis patients. Then was the second section called gingivitis. Gingivitis remained same exactly in the year 99 classification, which says dental biofilm induced, that is plaque induced. Instead of the word plaque, they use the word dental biofilm induced. Okay, only biofilm that is uh, in most of us, if we have gingivitis, then that would be this. Second would be mediated by systemic or local factors. So that, for example, someone who has a, a pubertal or pregnancy related inflammation, then that would be modified by systemic or local factors, which include a poor old life, uh, which includes what I call a poor hanging restoration, etc., causing gingival tightness, then that would be the condition there. The third would be drug induced and large anyone who's taking phenytoin sodium, amyloidopic calcium channel blockers, etc., and have gingival enlargement, then they all would come into this category. Gingival disease is non biofilm induced. So, what was non plaque induced earlier or specific bacterial, etc., came in that came into this condition called gingival diseases, non biofilm induced, which include all the genetic, like idiopathic gingival fibromatosis, herpetic, uh, viral, uh, fungal, etc., or immune and inflammatory mediators like femphigus. Uh, or reactive processes, cancers of the gingiva, endocrine, all these came into the section traumatic. So, for example, if you've been boxed by your friend and you have ulcer in gingiva, then that also would come into gingival diseases, which would be non dental biofilm induced, and also gingival hyperpigmentation. 
we in India would contest this because most of our patients have hyperpigmented gingiva. Back. Yeah. So that's about entire gingival diseases category. So biofilm induced, non biofilm induced. Okay, biofilm induced will become gingivitis, what the earlier terminology would be. Okay, and non anything apart from biofilm induced due to some specific indication, specific causative factor which is known, all that would come into non biofilm induced. On the other hand, periodontitis came into the second section. Uh, in the in periodontitis, we first now had necrotizing periodontitis. In India, necrotizing periodontitis are not as common as in the West. I don't know for what reason they are they're so obsessed. I have not I've just seen one case of enough in my life uh, as of yet. Uh, but uh, I don't know in the West, it's pretty obsessed about this terminology. Necrotizing periodontitis is so gingivitis, which is causing the severe amount of inflammation and is necrotizing by nature with a necrotizing ulcer, then that comes into this section. Uh, then necrotizing periodontitis, necrotizing stomatitis, nothing but no more, what we call when the literally the necrotic lesion goes all the way to involve the base of the mandible, etc., then that would be a no more condition necrotizing stomatitis. The next category was periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic diseases. Okay, exactly very similar to previous uh, conditions like type 1 diabetes, mellitus, etc. All that would come into that section. The third was generally the simple word called periodontitis. Now, the periodontitis which we initially classified in the previous section as chronic or uh, aggressive now got classified in onto stages and grades. Okay, what they did here was they staged it. Uh, there was no age and uh, there was no rate of progression. Both of them were remote. They are now classifying this based at the amount of bone loss or attachment loss at the time of you seeing the patient. Okay, so it is classification based at the time of presentation of the patient into the clinic. And it's single sitting classification. You don't have to wait for two or three things to classify this. So what they did here was stages. Stage one, two, and three, four. Stage one is initial, moderate, stage two. Stage three is severe with uh, potential for tooth loss. So for example, you had someone a uh, patient with uh, six mm attachment loss, but the tooth was shaking. Then the and if you think that that tooth would eventually undergo an extraction, then that would be severe periodontitis. Stage four would be with potential for loss of uh, entire dentition. It means that someone who has got like eight mm, nine mm pocket, severe amount of abscesses, severe bone loss, teeth. Are, most of the teeth are grade three, and you cannot save them. Then yes, then you classify them as what you call severe stage four periodontitis. Though means they were losing the entire dentition in the mouth. The second was extent and distribution. And what they did here was they the same terminology of localized and generalized were, were used. So if you had less than 10, 30 percent of the sites involved, then that would be localized. So out of 28 teeth, if someone who had 10 teeth with signs of periodontitis, then it was localized. More than 10 would be generalized. Also, uh, there was a terminology which we used earlier known as localized aggressive periodontitis where the disease was limited only to the incisors and the molars. So they came back to a very, very old terminology called molar incisor distribution. So extent and distribution could be localized, generalized or molar incisor distribution. Then they graded it. What did they grade? Depending upon a tentative estimate, it is not sure, on a tentative rate of uh, disease uh, rate of progression, they said, and also the response to anticipated response, that's like prognosticating. So they classified it as periodontitis as grades. Grade A was slow rate of progression. So for example, I can have a patient in my clinic who is 20 year old uh, with grade A, that is slow rate of progression and can have initial periodontitis. So someone who is like your age group has probably one mm of recession or one mm, uh, four, uh, four mm deep periodontal pocket, okay? His hygiene is good, etc., and is localized, means less than 10 teeth have that situation. Then I can grade him or her as a grade A stage one periodontitis with localized. On the other hand, I can have a 20 year old patient, grade four, someone who's got very severe periodontitis with no literally most of the teeth in his or her jaw to be extracted. 
okay with rapid rate of progression grade c so the age went away but what we got now is the rate at which our tentative estimate of the clinician's experience that okay whether the tooth would stay in the mouth or no would then determine the grades and the stages of periodontitis so what it did this does was it makes our treatment plans that much more easier okay so if someone is stage 1 and grade a it's simple treatment plan like scaling root training and reinforcement of hygiene whereas it is stage 3 then it would include scaling root training periodontal surgery gtr some extraction some teeth replacements and much more frequent recall and visits so that's what you do or uh, depending upon the stage so it made diagnosis as well as treatment planning that much more easier okay so this is the same thing in a much uh, bigger slide apart from uh, periodontal disease they also now classified peri implant diseases so what they said number one is peri implant health so where you don't have any bleeding you have anything around the peri implant tissue healthy tissue uh, two is peri implant mucositis is very similar or analogous to what we call as gingivitis in our patients in novel patients so that becomes peri implant mucositis uh, means there is no bone loss around an implant that's peri implant mucositis stage 3 uh, group 3 is uh, peri implant itis where you have loss of some bone around an implant and group 4 is what we call severe amount of peri implant hardened soft tissue deficiency so after placement of the implant patient has lost a lot of soft tissue exposing the implant threads etc like similar to root recession uh, something like that so that became peri implant disease classification okay then they obviously had uh, periodontal manifestations of the diseases and acquired conditions very similar to what was there in the 99 class other periodontal kind of periodontal abscesses and periodontal lesions uh, they also added certain mucogingival deformities and conditions around it that include gingival phenotype so we can have patients who have thick thin or a moderate phenotype gingival and soft tissue recession recession became a classification earlier recession was always used as a diagnosis of periodontal disease now we now say someone like uh, someone of your age with one tooth that is Consider the over three one, which is ABD placed, and there is recession. So the diagnosis is recession with three one, no periodontitis. So you are not a patient who has periodontitis, but you just have a soft tissue recession. So that became an independent diagnostic point, and that's very important. Then lack of gingiva, uh, decreased vestibular depth, apparent frenal attachment, gingiva, excessive gingiva, that's idiopathic fibromatosis, bad abnormal color. It's actually not now. Right terminology to use classification of exposed uh, condition of exposed root surface. So whether the patient has a recession and along with that whether there is a root caries because that would then help in determining your treatment plan. Traumatic occlusal forces that is primary or secondary trauma from occlusion or orthodontic forces. Uh, various processes to, to that may lead to plaque. So if someone who has bad uh, poor hanging restorations etc. that would come into this area. Necrotizing. Uh, This is the same chart again. So now let's just summarize of the classification of periodontal diseases. Now the latest classification, 2017-18, published in 2018, 1920. Okay. So what this says, it classifies the peri implant, uh, peri peri periodontal diseases and conditions into three sections. First section is periodontal health and gingival diseases. Second is periodontitis, and third are other conditions affecting the periodontium. Periodontal health, uh, it means that there's absolutely no signs of any inflammation. Clinically, the patient is absolutely healthy and doesn't have any issues. Second is gingivitis, which includes primarily biofilm or plaque induced. And third is gingival diseases without any biofilm factor. Without even in case of excellent hygiene, patients can have these diseases. Periodontal diseases, periodontitis, on the other hand, got classified as uh, necrotizing periodontal diseases. Periodontitis per se, and then periodontitis manifestations, systemic diseases, and condition. So, what are necrotizing diseases? Very necrotizing lesions. Periodontitis got grouped into stages: spread and extent, and then grades. Stages can be initial, moderate. Uh, stage three is with potential of tooth loss. Stage four with severe degree of uh, periodontal disease, which may mean that the patient may lose all his dentition. grading said that whether you can be in a stage where your patient can have moderate rate and has a decent degree of response to treatment grade c is very bad response to treatment and then on the other hand you then have what we call as the last section one sec
the last section uh, of uh, the of the condition uh, what we call as periodontitis manifest system in this internet so that includes down syndrome type 1 diabetes mellitus papillon diffuse syndrome so all the systemic syndromic patients who have periodontitis come into this section then is other conditions affecting the periodontium which includes systemic conditions affecting the periodontal supporting tissues periodontal abscesses endoperi lesions root recessions mucous gingival deformities traumatic forces and other hydrogen causes so all of them come into the other conditions affecting the periodontium Apart from that, you had periodontal implant diseases as classification, periodontal implant health. If there's no issue around an implant. Two is periodontal implant mucositis with similar to inflammation of the gingiva or natural teeth. Stage th uh, the third one is periodontal implant arthritis, very similar to periodontal implant arthritis. It means that there is inflammation of soft tissue, also bone loss around an implant. Four is periodontal implant severe amount of hard and soft tissue deficiency. Where, for example, an implant is there, there's a crown, but the soft tissue as well as bone on that have completely. Deceded. So this is about the classification of periodontal diseases. It is going to take some time for all of you to understand this in detail, uh, probably as we cover each and every topic uh, over a period of time. So thank you so much. Uh, so I will cease the recording here. And uh, please understand this uh, topic is there for your uh, internal.